is Brad Thompson, and I'm the Executive Director of the Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism. And I'd like to welcome all of you uh, this afternoon uh, to this, uh, our John W. Pope uh, lecture for this semester. Uh, before we begin, I would like to take this opportunity to publicly thank the Pope Foundation for their generous support of this lecture series. And at this time, I'd also like you uh, now just to take a moment and turn off your cell phones and beepers, please, before we begin. Now, if it is possible to speak intelligently about that overused term, public intellectual, I think we can use it properly and without reservation uh, and without embarrassment to describe our guest speaker today, Virginia Postrel. Ms. Postrel is one of America's most insightful writers about the past, the present, and the future. She writes on a remarkable range of topics, including economics, history, politics, culture, science, psychology, technology, and fashion. And she wraps it up and ties it all together with a sophisticated political philosophy. To give you a quick sense of her range and appeal as a public speaker, Ms. Pas Pastrell has spoken at the World Luxury Congress and at the Naval War College. You have to love a woman who can speak about the politics of high-heeled pumps and the aesthetics of armored vehicles. Virginia is also the author of two wonderful books. The first is The Substance of Style, How the Rise of Aesthetic Value is Remaking Commerce, Culture, and Consciousness, and The Future and Its Enemies, The Growing Conflict Over Creativity, Enterprise, and Progress. And she is uh, currently writing a book on, of all things, glamour. Today, she is a contributing editor at the Atlantic Monthly, where she writes uh, a regular, semi-regular column for them. And she's also been a columnist at the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Forbes. And for over 10 years, she was the editor of Reason Magazine. Uh, Virginia also blogs at her two blog sites, The Dynamist and Deep Glamour. Uh, Camille Paglia. I uh, once uh, referred to Virginia Postrel as one of the smartest women in America, and I think that's just so. I could go on and on about Virginia's uh, various accomplishments, of which there are many, but let me conclude with, with one last thought. What I think to me is most impressive about Virginia Postrel is that she lives her values. Virginia is, for instance, a vocal advocate uh, of living organ donation. And in 2006, she donated one of her kidneys to her friend Sally Sattel. Not only does she talk the talk, she walks the walk. Enough said. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me and give a warm Clemson welcome to Virginia Postrel. Thank you, Brad. I thought you were going to conclude by saying I'm from Greenville. <laughs> well, uh, as Brad mentioned my two books, and uh, the ideas that I'm going to be talking about today uh, are from uh, my first book, uh, The Future and Its Enemies, which was published in 1998, which of course means it does not talk about Twitter, but the, the uh, the concepts are the same. Um, in thinking about how to, what I should talk about and how to, you know, structure the, the talk, I started with the idea of, you know, this is the Center for Capitalism, and let's start with a fundamental question uh, that is always lurking behind our economic discussions, but uh, we never really talk about it, and that is the question of, what is an economy for? What is an economy? What does it do? Uh, you know, we talk about it all the time, the economy, oh, uh, um, you know, the economy is bad, the economy is good, but what is, what is an economy? And what is an economy for? And a very common response, uh, which is certainly not inaccurate, is to say an economy is a way of allocating resources. 
And that is certainly true. And that describes a market economy. It describes a communist economy. It describes a subsistent agricultural economy. It, it, uh, you know, it, it describes the, the economy of Renaissance Venice and the economy of, 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 of contemporary India. I mean, any economy in one way or another allocates resources. Um, but I think that this phrase, uh, which you may have seen in economic textbooks or such, can be misleading um, and can lead us down a, a wrong path. Because first of all, when I hear this economy re allocates resources, I think of it, it's like the economy is Santa Claus. The economy is Santa Claus, and Santa Claus has this bag of goodies. And, uh, and he decides, you know, uh, who's been naughty and who's been nice, and he allocates the goodies according to uh, of some measure of, of values. And this leads to, th this concept of the economy as Santa Claus allocating a fixed bag of goodies leads us to have an awful lot of political discussions around the question of who gets what. Uh, you know, who's naughty, who's nice, wait a minute, I'm nice, how come I didn't get a lot of good goodies? Um, you know, they're naughty, how, uh, how come they are rich, that's not fair. You know, we have a lot of political discussions around uh, the question of who does Santa Claus give what's in the bag? How does, is, is the way the economy allocates resources fair? And those are very interesting discussions, and those are not what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about what is, in some ways, I, th I think, a much more fundamental question, which is what is in the bag and how did it get there? Uh, and here I want to suggest a different and uh, equally accurate but perhaps more poetic uh, way of describing what the economy does, which is that it matches creativity and desire. Creativity, the, uh, the, if you want to talk like an economist, the supply side of the economy with desire, the demand side of the economy. And w if you think about the economy as matching creativity and desire, that does not necessarily describe every economy. Or at least it allows us to think about economies in terms of do they do it well or do they do it badly? How good a match is it between creativity and desire? Do you get what do you want or is it like the old, uh, you know, those, those stories that used to come out of the old planned economy of the Soviet Union where, you know, you could have whatever kinds of shoes you wanted as long as they were, you know, brown pseudo leather in size nine. Uh, but anything else you didn't want, uh, you know, whatever you might want, uh, you couldn't get. Uh, so how good a match is there, how, how good is the economy at eliciting and rewarding creative effort? So it's one thing to have creativity. See, I did it so it was parallel because I'm a writer, so I like a one-word thing and a one-word thing, creativity and desire. But in a way, what the, really the economy matches is creative effort and desire. So it's not just sitting in your study thinking creative thoughts. It's actually translating them into something that's tradable in the economy. Uh, how much creative effort does the economy uh, elicit and, and how does it reward it? And how good is the economy at identifying and serving all kinds of different desires, um, not just the easily named ones like, you know, enough calories so you don't starve and a roof over your head, uh, but also ones that are maybe hard to describe, maybe intangible uh, th experiences, uh, things that nobody's thought of but they really love when they see it. You know, how do, how is that economy at uh, rewarding of, you know, the creation of something like the iPod, which nobody knew they really lusted after until they saw it. Um, and this is a way, these kinds of questions, if we think of the economy in this sort of way, it's a much more, for, first of all, dynamic view of what's in Santa's bag. It's not just the same fixed group of items. It's always changing and potentially growing. And it also allows us to compare 
different kinds of economies. And it allows us to think about what is for developed countries, especially those sort of that are, are really, really productive, like the U.S., the critical and very most difficult question for economic growth, which is the question of what do you do next? Um, if you are an economy like China and, uh, or you know, Korea in an earlier period, these very rapidly industrializing economies, growing economies, one reason that they can grow so quickly is that they know already what to make because other countries have pioneered those things. So they can innovate on processes, and on my, deep, my blog at deepglamour.net, we ran a, a book excerpt. It was an amazing story about the innovations in the uh, uh, freshwater pearl industry in, in China, which is transforming the pearl business. I never knew until I read this book. It's a fascinating story. Um, they can innovate in processes. They can, th there is innovation within those, uh, that economy. There certainly was a great deal of innovation in terms of uh, manufacturing organization when Japan was rapidly industrializing. But they already knew people wanted cars. I mean, the people in China, they already know people want socks. They want refrigerators. They want you know, these various things, both for their own people domestically and also for export. They have to think much less about what is it that doesn't already exist that people might want. And in an economy like ours, that is the central challenge. What is it that doesn't exist that might be a source of growth? Uh, or what is, it, uh, what is a way of organizing or tweaking or changing something that does exist that fundamentally transforms it that could also be a source of growth. So you see, for example, uh, you know, once upon a time, this is an old story, but we knew that people needed steel, uh, but you had the complete transformation of the steel industry with the growth of mini mills, which made steel from recycled steel. Uh, you had the, com you know, retailing is nothing new, but you've seen a transformation of the way retailing logistics work because of thing, uh, techniques pioneered by Walmart. But this question of what do you do next is a very fundamental question for an economy that is already developed, big, productive. And it's very hard, and you can only address that question effectively, I would argue, with rules that, rec uh, that encourage underlying rules that rec uh, encourage creativity and, and um, comb recombinations. What do I mean by this? I bring up uh, the idea of combinations because we often hear, you know, the world is running out of resources. There's a limit to progress. Economic progress is intrinsically limited because there's a fixed amount of stuff in the world. Um, but the thing is, what's the limit is not really the amount of stuff in the world. It's not even the number of ideas in the world. It's the way those things can be recombined. And when you start to combine things and recombine them, you get the number of possibilities gets very big very fast. So for example, if you take six of the standard Lego blocks that have the uh, eight little pegs, you can get 915 million combinations of those. And if you limit yourself just to ones that are six blocks high, you can get 103 million uh, combinations. And in fact, this is the case where there's been a little revisionism because the Lego company put out the 103 million uh, figure. And, and then a guy online, a mathematician, said, now wait a minute, that seems much too small to me. Look, even if you just move the one block, you know, you can get this 46 combinations anyway. Uh, and so he redid the calculation in this very, very complicated way that required advanced computers and, and, and such. And he found out that, in fact, it's this much larger number. And that's just six Lego blocks. Um, and, and we can see, I, I found this online, I have to share this with, there's this artist, Nathan Sawaya, who makes these incredible sculptures out of, of Lego blocks, using Legos as an artistic medium. 
And that's just Lego blocks. To take another very familiar homey example, if you take a deck of 52 cards, those cards can be uh, combined 10 to the 68 uh, different ways. And for those of you who, you know, don't deal with the scientific notation all the time, that's that many. Uh, and, and so that's really a big number. <laughs> you know, there's not a name for that number. Um, and so that probably means that any time you shuffle a deck, it's a, it's a new combination that has never come up in the history of cards, li quite likely. Now, they're all kind when you ha are dealing with numbers like this, and this is a, you know, small set of things when compared to the number of, you know, things in the world that you could recombine, or atoms, or words, or musical notes, or what, computer code. Um, there are all kinds of combinations that can come up, and the question is, you know, one, how do we encourage people to come up with innovative ideas like this? And secondly, how do we decide which ones are any good? And for example, something that was just introduced at the Toy Fair in New York is this is Barbie as a video camera. Uh, so that's a combination of Barbie and a video camera. It's supposed to be like a hot thing uh, in this season. You know, we'll see. How do you decide whether Barbie and a video camera is a good idea or a bad idea? Do you, you know, do you go to the, uh, the, you know, the Barbie Authority Bureau in, in some central place, or do you, uh, you know, see if, if kids will buy it? And you know, because when you're sitting in a meeting in Mattel deciding whether to bring this to market, you know, you've got some ma market research, you've got some theories. Um, but ultimately, you have to throw it out and, and try it. So the question of how do you decide what things succeed is a critical one in thinking about the rules for a good economy. And here, the, the basic idea is that you want to protect the ability to innovate, and you also want to protect the processes of feedback. You want to protect uh, what, what I call uh, criticism by expression, which is, you know, like the, that would be so, with, you protect it with something like the First Amendment. Criticism by expression is otherwise known as complaining, um, you know. And you also, but even more fundamentally or, or equally important if you're looking for economic progress, you need to protect criticism by example, which is saying I can do it better than you and here's my theory and I'm going to go out and try it. S against that is the technocratic uh, temptation, the idea that we know what the best thing to do is. And the thing is, we often talk about the technocratic temptation as if this is something that evil Washington bureaucrats suffer from. But in fact, we all suffer from it to some degree. Anytime you sit in First of all, you have to. If you're going to be a business person, you have to have theories. The question is then, what? It, how do you test them? Do you test them in the marketplace, or do you test them by, you know, trying to impose them on people? Um, and it's very easy to get sucked into discussions in public policy uh, circles of, you know, I really know exactly what. Um, a, a free market and organs ought to look like, to talk about that, or I really know what health insurance should look like, um, and, uh, you know, what the institutional arrangements should be. Um, I, I, I know, you know, I really like my car and that's how cars uh, should be, or I have ideas about how daycare centers should be run or what education should be like. It's a, very often, people who care about education, smart people, uh, will get into discussions that immediately go to the curriculum should look like this for everyone. As opposed to, if I were starting a school, my curriculum would look like this, and then we'd see how I do versus your curriculum. And one of the, you often hear in, uh, in national discussions these buzzwords. We need a comprehensive national whatever. I was once on, in the future and its enemies, I tell the story about, I was once on TV and I was debating uh, somebody on, on uh, a now defunct C CNN show, and, and she was advocating for, you know, we need a comprehensive national policy, and it was about the regulation of daycare. But it could have been about anything. I mean, it could have been about 
energy prices, it, about energy. It could have been about uh, school curriculum. It could have been about medical devices. Uh, this idea that the better system is the comprehensive na uh, national system is one that is commonly shared, especially by smart people. Uh, the smarter you are, the more ingenious you are coming up with a better idea for a system. And, and, and you know, it, it's, it's a common, and again, I want to emphasize that this is not just bureaucrats, it's not just policy people, it's not even always just in the political debate, it's often just a, an intuitive thing. I found this online, but I've heard it from many people online. This woman writes in to a newspaper columnist and she says, you know, stores need to imp uh, implement some sort of size standardization. At one place I could barely fit into a size 12, at another I took a size 8. Why do stores do this? It, if, if it makes shopping very frustrating. Why can a size 10 be a size 10 be a size 10? And that is completely logical and totally wrong. Because, <laughs> I mean, Anybody who's gone shopping has pretty much had this experience because even within the same store, the sizes may not mean the same thing. But the reason that sizes are inconsistent is that bodies are this not the same. These, these are actual body scans of women who wear a size 8. And as you can see, uh, this, this is from the Cornell Textile School. As you can see, they are shaped differently. And if a size 8 was a size 8 as a size 8, and in the 40s, the U.S. government did, in fact, have size standards. At th th they established them at the request of the catalog uh, retailers. Um, but, you know, if, if every size 8 is the same, that means it's really great for a few people, and everybody else, their clothes don't fit. Uh, so it, th this wanting to accommodate diversity sometimes leads to things that sound inefficient until you think about the fact that people are different, their, their bodies are different, their wants are different, their, you know, what, what bothers them is different, how they use their, the demands on their time is different, what trade-offs they would rather, what's valuable to them versus not valuable. People are really different, and so the casualties of one best way or the technocratic uh, temptation of saying everything's going to be like this are first of all you can't accommodate diversity and secondly it's very hard to accommodate discovery even if you don't intend to prohibit something just the fact that you hadn't thought of it yet you can make rules that don't allow it and my favorite example is there was a wonderful innovation, uh, in my view, which was the development of grape tomatoes, which are, you know, unbelievably delicious and pretty cheap and, and much more reliably ripe than big tomatoes. And I wrote about how this had happened. I, there was an article that I read someplace. I wrote about it on my blog, and I heard from a guy who lives in Belgium. And, uh, and he wrote to me about why you can't find grape tomatoes in the European Union. And it's not that the European Union has, you know, has protectionist laws to keep them from coming in the U from the U.S. Or, or they think there's something evil about grape tomatoes. It's just that when they made their rules about what tomatoes you can sell in the EU, they didn't think of grape tomatoes. So you can sell round, ribbed, oblong, or elongated. That would be like uh, um, the kind you use in Italian food now. I forgot the name. Uh, and cherry tomatoes, but cherry tomatoes are the round ones, not the grape tomatoes. So you can't have grape tomatoes in the EU because uh, nobody thought of them before when they made the regulations. And so in order to make these, uh, it, to market them, you would have to change the rule. And another favorite example of this type of thing uh, was in California. This is a bit of history that has been written out of the history books. So I'm going to share it with you because I lived through it. In, in roughly 1990, California adopted a law that said by some date, let's say 2000, uh, a certain percentage of all the cars on the road in California had to be zero emissions vehicles, by which they meant 100% electric cars. The word hybrid never occurred to them. It was, you know, now it's trendy and green and groovy and every movie star has a Prius, uh, but back then 
it was like grape tomatoes in, in the European Union. Hybrid was not on the agenda. And so the law did not even, the, eventually they changed it to redefine a hybrid, which is not in fact a zero emission vehicle, but as a special kind of zero emission vehicle to allow it. But it, it, did, it would not have made this standard because they knew in their minds what the future of fuel efficient cars would be. It would be electric vehicles and they didn't even think of this alternative. Um, now that is sort of an accident and that, and when you have an accident like that, often things do get changed. But there's another type of technocratic temptation where you really want that one best way. You know people don't want it, but you're going to force it on them anyway. And, you know, my, uh, my bet noir these days is that, you know, ever since the 1970s when I was at JL Mann High School in Greenville, people have been saying we should use fluorescent, combat fluorescent bulbs instead of incandescent bulbs. And over this long period of time, they have gradually, the bulbs have gotten better and they've become more and more common, particularly commercial establishments. Your typical hotel uses them because they want to save money on their energy. They become more and more common, but they're not common enough for the folks at Greenpeace who want you to have the message, this one is good and that one is bad. And so instead of continuing to make the case and try to get people to know that you know that you can find if you search enough you can find ones that aren't God awful um, they finally finally uh, they've been banning incandescent bulbs they've been banned in US uh, they've been banned in Europe and under the Bush administration with significant Republican support in Congress uh, the energy bill was passed which will ban de facto it's put it bans incandescent bulbs as of 2012, and I gave, I talked about this in a different context at Princeton, and the uh, the takeaway that most of the faculty there got was it's time to start hoarding incandescent bulbs. Uh, <laughs> they did. Um, and so I'm sure many of you saw the okay, so it's green police Audi uh, ad. Plastic. plastic. That's the magic word. What? Green police. <laughs> you picked the wrong day to mess with the ecosystem, plastic boy. <laughs> You just saw these bulbs? Yeah. Tragedy strikes tonight where a man has just been arrested for possession of an incandescent light bulb. So, you know, we're not going to that. That's, the, the regulations are much more indirect. They just forbid selling the light bulbs, uh, not owning them. It's sort of like when they decriminalize pot or something, you know. It's, um, uh, and the thing is, you will see brilliant, smart people, many of them engineers, writing on websites and articles about how this is no big deal because these, you know, these, these compact fluorescents save money. Uh, if you, you know, they're, they're almost as good. If you get the, exactly the right kind, you really can dim them, et cetera. Um, and, and what is really going on is a conflict of values, that there is the idea that you might like something for a reason other than just the measurable output of lumens uh, is, is not, doesn't count. So for example, in Europe, one of the issues has been that there are these art exhibits that use light bulbs, including some that are, this is a classic uh, uh, one from the, from the modernist period. Uh, that has a hundred, it, it's bigger than this picture, it has 140 light bulbs involved. And they, c museums have these on display and once those light bulbs burned out, the art will be fundamentally changed. And there was a big article and there was big controversy in Europe about it. And so this, the, the PR guy at the European Union said in response, you know, only the production and the import of new light bulbs will be, gra be gradually forbidden. In the meantime, artists can make beautiful artworks with light bulbs that are allowed by EU regulation. For example, improved bulbs with halogen technology or LED lights. Now, I love LED lights and I love halogen bulbs and, 
you know, I love neon, which is a form of fluorescent light, but, you know, who are they to decide that this is, you know, that these kinds of things are okay and this other is not? And by the way, the analogy he made is, it is as if artists were trying to work with anti-personnel landmines. Uh, that, or, you know, <laughs> if, 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 if and, and what's interesting to me about this is, let's say you want to, you, for whatever reason, it's whether you're concerned about global warming or some other reason, uh, you want to get people to use less energy. Do you say what kinds of technologies they can use? Like you can use compact fluorescence but not light bulb, uh, not incandescent light bulbs? Or do you say put a tax on energy or just in increase energy rates uh, and let people decide, well, you know, I really want to have a, I want to have incandescent light bulbs in my bathroom because I don't want it when I come in in the morning, I don't want to be waiting for the lights to come on and I, I, and I actually, I have this, I have a bunch of different lights over my bathroom. I have one uh, fluorescent and it's very slow so as I'm in the bathroom gradually it gets brighter. But anyway, you know, but I'm willing to put my air conditioning on a higher temperature in the summer. Uh, because, you know, I'm at work most of the day, and I'll just let the house get hot, and I'll suffer a little, I'll, you know, go to the movies at night till it cools down, or whatever. It's easier in Southern California than here. Um, but, uh, or I could buy a smaller house, or I could walk to work. I mean, there are lots of different ways a person within their own life, knowing what's important to them, might, uh, might decide to save energy that are not necessarily the way that somebody writing a prescriptive bill in Congress would decide is the way you should do it. There's a lot of innovation and there are a lot of values that tend not to get discussed when you go to this technocratic route. And I actually have spent a fair amount of time talking to interior designers because I write about aesthetics and style. And interior designers, regardless of, and, and then they tend to be very green oriented but they go crazy with these rules because th in certain kinds of, say, restaurant environments, you want to have some nice warm lights so the customers look good and feel good and, you know, and, and you could economize on your energy somewhere else. Um, and I find it interesting going to, uh, that when people write these bills, they do consult and actually one, you know, they talk to research engineers, they talk to environmental groups, and very importantly, they talk to the light bulb manufacturers. I mean, Philips, GE, totally okay with this. Why? Because now they can sell you a really expensive light bulb instead of one that sells for like nothing and is a, com uh, a commodity product where they have to compete with, you know, Joe's light bulbs in, in Shanghai or whatever. They did not talk to interior designers or artists who deal in you know, intangibles like the warmth of the light as opposed to the measurable output, and they certainly didn't talk to light bulb users. We just woke up one day and in 2012, these things are going to be illegal. So what this points out is, I, I, don't, I don't use this as an illustration, you know, as, as, a, as a sort of just a general screed against regulation, although it's that too, but Th there is a point that there is hidden knowledge, there's unarticulated knowledge, there are things that are hard to bring to the table uh, when everything has to be thought of in advance and measured. And this is true in business as well as in government. So for example, in the early 90s, uh, apparel manufacturers decided they were going to get scientific about their business. And they were going to, they brought in consultants who you know, analyzed trends and told them two absolutely true things. American women were getting older and they were getting fatter. And these two things were absolutely true and from that apparel, various large apparel companies decided that what they needed to do was stock the stores with basics for these old fat women. Um, and the problem is, you know, and the basics were a flop. 
And the problem was that the old fat women already had the basics, and they didn't really need another black pair of pants or, uh, you know, whatever. And, and what did people buy? They bought slip dresses, not an old fat woman product. <laughs> Actually, I don't think they really look good on anybody, but that's, that, that's my opinion. I'm not going to write it into the law. <laughs> and they bought these uh, mini-skirted suits, which at that time, this is you know going back uh, to the early 90s, they were on Melrose Place. And this was, it had spread sort of from these images on TV into people really liking that, that look. And that was very successful, which is, again, uh, not something you would immediately project from the demographics. And Amy Spindler of the New York Times wrote an article about this and how this sort of scientific projection of fashion had flopped because of this X factor, this, this thing that, you know, fashion sells when something innovative is presented, something no consumer could have anticipated. Of course, there's a lot of stuff that flops that is also innovative. Uh, it, fashion X factor is that unknown quality that makes an item seem hot to a consumer. Well, that's true not only of fashion, where it's a recognized phenomenon, but it's true of many things in the economy, especially when they are new and creative, and suddenly you have um, uh, some invention that nobody had thought of. So, for example, some years ago I heard the um, CEO and founder of Lens Crafters talk. And lens crafters grew by saying, you know, we'll make your glasses in about an hour. And this was an idea that they came up after a great deal of, of, of consumer research in which nobody said, I want glasses in an hour. They did focus groups and they asked people what they cared about their glasses and they talked about style and fit and the prescription being accurate and all the things that optometrists and opticians had known about from time immemorial. But what they observed was something intangible. They observed that their potential customers were stressed out, that they felt pressed for time. Maybe they didn't want, I don't know, but maybe they didn't want, it was hard to get people to go take time to be in the focus groups, I don't know. But they, and they came up with this idea of, you know, if we could do your glasses fast while you're in the mall shopping, we could really gain a lot of market share. And this worked beautifully for them. I mean, it's, it, things have changed since then, but that was a case where people were not even saying, people who were being asked, what do you want, were not saying it. And another very successful company, which when you think about it, I cannot believe it exists, but I just love this store, is the Container Store. I mean, why would you have a store full of boxes? I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, but it is phenomenally successful. Um, because partly it goes to my work on glamour, partly people go in there and they see the glamorous vision of their organized life and they really want it. Um, <laughs> um, and partly it's because an amazing amount of innovation and thought is on display in one place. So that there are things that solve problems, like if you can think of some organizational problem you have in your house, if you go to the container store, there's probably some kind of solution to it. I sound like an ad, oops, they didn't pay me. I, I wish they would, you know, gift certificates please. Um, and, and they actually have an explicit managerial philosophy of trying to figure out the the customer's unarticulated needs. And they talk about it in terms of the man in the desert. The man in the desert comes to an oasis and the first thing somebody gives him is water because that's the obvious need. And that's how a lot of stores operate is, you know, you come and they, uh, but, but by having a conversation you realize that he also needs a place to clean up and stay for the night and all these sorts of things. And if they have a conversation with their customers like that, they can, you know, sell them more stuff, which is hence, uh, at, matching um, creativity and, and desire. So how would you fi have a store that's so successful doing such a peculiar thing? Because somebody tried it and it turned out that people who hadn't said they want a store selling boxes in fact did. And this brings me to Twitter. Now how many of you have Twitter accounts? Yeah, that's about what I ex expected. So, and how many of you know really know, I'm going to explain it anyway, but how many of you really know what Twitter is? Okay, so more. All right, so the original idea of Twitter is pretty much illustrated in this. Cool it with the Twitter updates, okay? I'm sitting on the patio. I know you're sitting on the 
So this is the much mocked, I mean, this is one example of it. But the original idea of Twitter was to have a service that from a cell phone, you could do it from the internet, but uh, online, uh, you could do it from a web page, but from a cell phone, using just 140 characters, you could tell your friends where you were, what you were doing. So, you know, I just got to Clemson to give a speech. Um, and your friends would follow you and you would follow them so you could send out these messages. But all, all the rules were was 140 characters, you could send it from a web or, or a, a, a phone a text message uh, to 40404, and you could choose who you wanted to follow, what Twitter accounts you wanted to receive messages from. And unlike, say, Facebook, it wasn't this kind of reciprocity of friends. I, you know, I can follow somebody who never heard of me, and, and vice versa, somebody I never heard of can follow me. Um, you just, well, what happened? And, and they have some rules about policing fraud, and you know you can't pretend to be Virginia Postrel, and you know these sorts of things. Um, but the rules did not prescribe how you use Twitter. So, despite the fact that the founders had a very specific use in mind, it quickly turned into something else. So I have a. Oh, this is my Twitter page, my my account. So these are messages that I've sent just to give you some idea how you it looks like but it's a very you know limited resources 140 characters very very simple rules and 140 characters I counted the number of key just using what's on my keyboard it's actually a bigger number than this because you can use Chinese characters and Arabic and Hebrew and you know all these things but using what's on my standard keyboard there would be 68 to the 140 possible combinations. It can use a lot of different things, a lot of possibilities. So it's really caught on. There are about 50 million tweets. That's one message. That's my alarm telling me, oh, I'm right on time. Okay. Um, uh, there are about 50 million tweets a day. There are 75 million accounts, of which 22 million are in the U.S. So this is a worldwide phenomenon. And about 10 to 15 million people uh, are actually actively sending things. Now, some people just get an account and never look at it again. A lot of people decide to follow people, but just not to put up tweets themselves. So they, you know, they sign on, they follow celebrities, they follow uh, sports, they follow companies they like. And you've seen this amazing growth. There's a very interesting article on Wired. Um, so let me see if I can get this to work. So there was this, th there, there are a couple of big, one of the big moments in the history of Twitter was Aston, Ashton Kutcher started his own Twitter account. And this was, nobody had thought of the idea that a celebrity might have an account and not follow very many people himself, but have all his fans follow him. And a lot of other people do it now. And then, of course, the, the, place where Twitter really penetrated public consciousness of people who've never used it, seen it, heard of it, was with the Iranian elections. Because people in Iran could post things to the world easily through their cell phones without being monitored by the government. And then those things could get out to the state and uh, to the world. Um, and then since then, you've seen a great deal of other sorts of innovative uses of it in, in news, in on-scene reports, uh, and that sort of thing. I want to talk about some adaptations. So again, 140 characters. All characters are created equal in, in the initial uh, Twitter form. But users started to say, well, wait a minute. If I write about you, V. Postrel, say, or send you a message, I'm going to put this at sign in front of it. And then you can search and, and, and you can find yourself. Or if I take your message and I forward it onto my forwards, I'm going to put RT for retweet. Or we're all going to, and this was like totally bottom up, uh, you know, or we're going to say that you can put 
a hash mark in front of any word, any series of words, and that will become some, a subject that people can search for, and it might catch on and it might on. So, so all the Iranian election, there were a number of them, but this was a famous one. If you're a fan of Project Runway or Twilight, if you want to look for free stuff, contests, Deep Glamour, we run contests sometimes, so we'll put at the end of it, hashtag free uh, or hashtag contest or giveaway. And then there's, uh, Financial sites started using this in front of stock symbols. So if you want to find out what people are saying about Amazon or Microsoft, you can do uh, you can use that with a, uh, with the search function. So these are you know changing the meanings of things. There's also what do you do with you know how do you change the uses? There's news and on scene reports like uh, from Haiti or from. Uh, uh, Iran. There's live commentary. You're watching the Olympics and making comments, or you're watching the, the you know, final episode of Lost and commenting on it, or you're watching the presidential debates and commenting on it. It's a form of micro-blogging. Uh, you know, viral articles, videos, websites, things get passed around through Twitter. I find out about everything. Like, my husband is like, did you see this site of, of uh, unhappy hipsters? I was like, Oh man, I saw that like five days ago on Twitter. You know, I don't know how many of you see this. These are pictures of people who live in modernist houses who look unhappy and people have written snarky captions. Um, uh, but it spread first through Twitter and, you know, it, uh, companies use it for brand building. Uh, you know, we'll tell you about discounts at your favorite restaurant or um, some, some just have interesting Twitter feeds. Uh, and uh, I mentioned celebrities, and then there are these customs that have developed that use the hashtag, you know, what is FF or MM? Well, FF is Follow Friday, and on Fridays, people will often make a list of, they'll have the at sign and the names of Twitter handles, and, and MM is Music Mondays, where people recommend music that they like. And then there are these jokes that go around. So, like, if you do a search for fake movie titles, I think I have a picture. Of it. You can't really see, see this, but these are uh, oh, oh, fake movie titles is a is a genre. This is a specific example. Now with superheroes, so we've got um, shallow Hal Jordan. Uh, if you don't know superheroes, you don't know about that. Uh, um, my favorite, Soylent Green Lantern. Um, you know. Clay face off, you know, and all of these, and these people just showing how you know smart and funny they are, and um, and then there have been some adaptations on the software side. Twitter opened up it, it made its software available so people could create things to make using Twitter easier. So when I use Twitter, I actually use something that looks like this rather than a web page, which allows me to have. I have two different accounts. That's V Postrel, and then I have another one which you can barely see because it's dark, but is Deep Glamour. And I can post things and repost them on both of those. And here you can see how people, this is the food fashionista. She's thanking people who mentioned her tweets, and she has this list. Or uh, here's one where, uh, you know, this has been retweeted and retweeted again. And then there are these funny-looking URLs where, which there had long been these services on the internet that would shorten some long, god-awful URL into something short, but they were kind of marginal because you didn't, there wasn't a big need for them. But then when Twitter came around and you only had 140 characters, suddenly this whole uh, business blossomed. Stephen Levy, in this uh, article in Wired in, 2000, uh, in uh, October, described Twitter as saying it rocketed into the mainstream without really knowing what its service was. Its users defined it. Essentially, Twitter left a ball and stick in a field and lurked on the sideline as its users invented baseball. And I think that that is a, you know, if you're thinking about especially how to produce economic growth, you need underlying uh, rules that have that quality to them, that don't necessarily dictate outcomes, that provide a safe environment, uh, you know, protect against force, fraud, theft, it may be context specific to some of the, that allow experimentation to uh, discover unarticulated wants, including things that are esoteric and only appeal to a small number of people, permit new combinations, keep the units generic in terms of the way they're governed, which is really the basis of contract law. It's like they don't don't reify categories. That's a famous, that's a fancy way to say, you know, don't 
define a tomato too narrowly. Um, and use competition and criticism as feedback rather than uh, doing things by fiat. These are the sorts of rules that allow you to answer this very difficult question for advanced economies, which is what do you do next, that allow uh, this process of matching creative effort and desire, often unarticulated desire, to continue and the moral of the story is leave room for surprise. Thank you. Uh, for the first time in my life, I feel old. Uh, I, <laughs> you know, reading Aristotelian metaphysics is easier than understanding Twitter for me, but. Uh, <laughs> economists call an experience good. <laughs> you really, you know, it's like a movie. You sort of have to experience it in order yeah. to know what it's like. <laughs> All right, well, we've got lots of time uh, for questions from the audience, and it's our tradition that we'll take the first uh, question or two uh, from students. Yes. Yeah, I feel your pain. <laughs> Yeah, there are a couple of things that happened that weren't anticipated. I mean, you were not alone. And, and a lot of people not only thought it would dumb down the language, but thought it would kind of wither and die. Because how often do you need to tell somebody, you know, you're out for pizza? You know, <laughs> there's like 10 people who would be interested. Um, one of the things that allowed is because you can link to websites and, and using these URL shorteners, or you can just put the whole URL, um, you know, you can have a very short Twitter, a very short tweet that links to a long, nuanced article. Um, and you can also post, and through some of these add-on services, people can also post photos and videos. Um, people are amazingly creative. <laughs> and people have, you know, you can also, um, you know, sequence posts and put them together, and they and people have done. You know, they're really stunts, but you know, written novels on Twitter, uh, sort of the ultimate epistolary novel in uh, 140 uh, word segments or whatever. And and that's really a stunt. But who knows? You know, where things might go. Yes. Well, I think uh, the question was, you know, it seems more and more both sides of the political spectrum or po both parties or both sides of the political spectrum are trying for this national, comprehensive national par policy and what do you do about it and, and um, you know, what are the consequences. I mean, I'm very concerned. I think there are, you know, there are some nuances here. There are some difficult questions. This is not... You know, even in the terms of Twitter, you know, how do they police against spam, which is a form of sort of abuse, and what sort of policies are appropriate, and versus the ones that will rile up their uh, their their user base, but they have a very fast feedback, also. Um, so, you know, I can say certain kinds of general rules are important, but we can still end up with debates about specific, you know, specific examples. But I'm very concerned, and I think part of what you need to do, and part of what I do do, uh, is 
show people that you can have order without design, uh, that you can have, uh, and to show people also that many of the things that they value, including individualism, including diversity, um, are better protected by not having what is often, you know, sounds very seductive, which is a comprehensive national policy. I mean, just, just like the lady who wants a size 10 to be a size 10. Now, she's not talking about having the government do it, but even if it were an industry thing, it would be a problem. And, but, but it's not obvious, so you have to explain why it is that it's better to allow this kind of bottom-up diversity. I mean, it, it's, it kind of goes against our intuitions. Yes? Am I just talking about a version of federalism? I would say federalism is a version of what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, um, that, that and, and again, there are questions of, you know, how exactly federalism works and when is it good and when is it bad. But, but the insight of federalism is that if you have competing subunits that offer different options, um, people can sort and there can be testing and you can see, you know, this state tried this and it was really a disaster, so let's not emulate that. Or this state tried it and it was a huge success, so let's, let's adopt it in our state too. Um, there are problems because of transactions costs of moving from one state to another. Um, uh, you, you, there are certain kinds of fundamental rights. You know, I don't want like the First Amendment f experimented with from state to state. That's a kind of f you know, freedom of speech. I, I don't want there to be like freedom of speech in, ca in, in California and South Carolina, but not in Nevada and, and Georgia or something like that. I think that would be you know, a big mistake. Um, but, but I think that that sort of experimentation in subunits of government is something that partakes of this process. And the same thing you see. I spent um, a number, I've lived most of my adult life in Los Angeles, but I spent uh, seven years in Dallas. And one of the things that was striking about Dallas was the way that because there were lots of little cities around, around it, uh, the way that the school districts competed with each other. Um, and there are some complexities of that, but it, but it was interesting to see some of the positives that came out of the having these relatively small suburban districts competing, which is something that you find much less of in Southern California, uh, where I've spent most of my time. I feel like that guy in Ferris Bueller. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> yes, Hank. <laughs> Yeah, and the, the, the health issue that has been talked about a lot in this context that I think is wildly exaggerated is the very small mercury content in these bulbs, um, which does mean that if you're a good person and don't want to get arrested by the green police, you're supposed to dispose of them in a special way. But there are, for some populations, there are much bigger health pop there. There are certain people, because they have epilepsy or migraines or certain other underlying health conditions, where fluorescent lights can be very hard on them. And there was, you know, there's not an exemption, a health exemption in, in the law, because it's a one best way. And, and I, I have this friend in Dallas who is like the world's cheapest person, but he's really, really smart about it. He's not just cheap, he like is always finding the big bargains. And so he costed out all that, and he has CFLs in all his house, except in a few very specific uses, where 
uh, where it's one of these things where you want you only want to be able to turn on the light and have it immediately come on and uh, you you don't want to be waiting there uh, for for it to glow um, so you know there is this there a lot of people have made a lot of this mercury issue I think because uh, health is an argument that you can get greens to take seriously I think it would be better if they would take seriously the idea that this is not the best way to get people to use less energy that you know we can we could have a policy which would you know tax energy or, or uh, you know in, increase rates that would allow people to adjust their behavior in in ways uh, that would vary from person to person depending on what they cared about yes It's a very good question. There's a logically, uh, the question is, you know, will this 2012 ordinance about light bulbs be essentially repealed? And it's a very good question because I think in terms of popular outrage and also the goals of the bill, I mean, the other thing is when you get these very smart engineer types who throw a lot of numbers back and forth at each other, um, they often point out that you know the amount that you're going to save from these light bulbs is really dwarfed by you know cars or air conditioning or other factors. So it seems like even from the point of view of the goals, it ought to be possible to do something less coercive. But here's why I'm not as optimistic as I would be based on the man in the street, including a lot of people who are very sympathetic to the general goals which is the buy-in they got from the light bulb manufacturers. Um, you know, Philips and GE really want this. And they've also made plans and investments and, uh, and you know, based on the fact that the law is what it is. And so if it changes, you know, the proposal that it might change is something that they're going to be against even more than they were for the bill in the first place. Um, right, right. So, um, but I, th I think if politicians started to make an issue of it, you know, if you had a few politicians who decided this was going to be something that they would run on, um, I think it could get repealed because Unlike health care, it, it's very simple. You know, you could just, you don't have to repeal the whole 2007 energy bill, just repeal this one section. Um, that, I think, you know, is something that somebody could make great hay with in, in a congressional race or, a, um, and, and you could even say, and uh, not that I'm proposing, not that I support this, but, you know, you can say, you know, we're not going to repeal it, we're just going to put, you know, a, uh, 10 cent tax on uh, incandescent bulbs and the money will go for the, I don't know, some fund that, <laughs> this, the politician pork fund <laughs> to, to be handed out to favored constituencies. Yeah. I'm an incrementalist, see? <laughs> yes. Well, y yes and no. I mean, people definitely want, you know, they want a lot of stuff and they don't want to pay for it. And if you live in California, you really understand that because, <laughs> see, if you live in a, in a low tax, low spending relatively state like, like Texas or South Carolina, it, it's less perverse because, <laughs> um, uh, but, but I think that, that, you know, it depends. Yes, I, I think proposing taxes is always difficult, and for good reasons. It ought to be difficult, because you're asking, when you tax people's m income, you're doing with their money what, you know, we're talking about doing with their labels. We're, you're saying, you know, you're not going to use this money the way you would plan it. You're going to use it, you know, to pay for the the activities of the federal government, both ones you like and ones you don't. So it should be taken very seriously. 
Um, however, I will say that, you know, as an analyst, I worry more about regulation, partly because it's hidden, than I worry about taxes. At least we have a vigorous debate about taxes. People make a case for why they should be raised. They make a case for why they shouldn't be raised. They make a case for why they should be cut. They make a case for why they shouldn't be cut. We have a lot of political discussion around the issue of taxes. We have much less around the issue of regulations to the point that you can pass a, you know, a bill banning incandescent light bulbs and the public doesn't even know. Um, whereas if you had passed, a, you know, if we'd had a discussion about taxing every light bulb 10 cents, the public would have known about it, partly because there's certain implemented, you know, there's certain things in the congressional uh, process that require taxes to be discussed in a certain way. So, so yes, it is somewhat difficult to replace. Uh, and this is what you see in the whole debate o over what is misnamed cap and trade. The idea of cap and trade, which has problems in the context of global warming, but the idea was something from controlling pollution. You say there can't be any more than this level, you have permits, trade the permits, we don't tell you how to do it. The cap and trade bill operates not like that at all. It is, uh, there are permits, but there are ways for big companies to make a lot of money on them, but it, it is very prescriptive. It tells you what you use, it tells you how much you uh, emit. It, it's, it's not, it's taken this idea, it's kept the name and totally gutted the concept. Totally, not, has nothing to do with what you asked. I had to get that screed in. <laughs> yes. Uh, Houston doesn't have any, but other places like Dallas do. Well, and, and it's, it, this is a very interesting, this is actually an area that over the years I've written about and I'm very interested in the whole sort of urban environment. Um, and, and here I think you, it's, it's important to realize the diversity of wants because there are really people who they cannot stand to have other people close to them and they really want that suburban existence. They want the yard for the kids. They value that highly. There are also people, and I, I'm one of them, who prefer a more urban environment. In fact, when I lived in Dallas, I lived in the one part of town where it was hardly high-rises, but where it was townhouses and it was a walking-oriented neighborhood, although my husband and I were the only people who were not walking their dogs who actually walked because it's 109 degrees. Um, but, uh, uh, but but you do see this, and, and we're having tremendous fight. You have seen over the past 20 years or so a growth um, both among private competitive actors and among people who are trying to use zoning, you know, coercively but in the opposite way to increase density. And um, there is, when you're talking about new development, it's much easier to have competitive alternatives, uh, whether they're in terms of homeowners associations and the way developers sets up the planning or whether it's in terms of, go uh, of, of, of political governance. 
Uh, when you talk about an existing town, it's much harder. And we see this in Los Angeles, where I live, because logically we should be significantly increasing density. And I don't mean to have the Empire State Building. I mean to have, you know, six and seven story or, or even three and four story townhouses and such uh, because it's very dense and it's very hard to get around. And, uh, but there is tremendous resistance on the part of the people who are already there both because the California dream was based on a lower density than what we actually have, and also because, quite frankly, their houses are a lot more valuable when you can't build. Um, you know, it's, it, I mean, my condo is worth a whole lot more because it's virtually impossible to build on the west side of L.A. where I live. Um, and, and that is zoning, but it's not as simple as zoning. You know, zoning is relatively simple. You can have it can be relatively simple. There are all these blocking coalitions, and actually in New York, I mean, you would, it's very hard to build anything in New York, witness the World Trade Center, um, uh, uh, because there's so many blocking coalitions that have developed over time. And in New York, I think they developed in many cases as a reaction against the sort of uh, Robert Moses, too easy to tear things down and transform things um, without input from the residents. Um, and anyway, yes, I, I, I think that's an interesting case. Yes. Because there is. <laughs> Well, you know, it is it. This is you know, it is a country where, in most places, there is plenty of land, and there is you know, uh, that is that is what we have that's available to people. And people value talking about aesthetics. They value the aesthetics of being able to have that area uh, around them. And I think we need to respect those you know different different types of values in how we think about urban development, not just having, you know, again, it's very easy to get into the one best way. It's, it's easier for me to avoid it in the urban context because I know that my tastes are weird. I'm, re I'm really happy that there's been a turn where in a place like Dallas, you, I could find a neighborhood that matched my tastes, and that is a, a, an effect of sort of changing conversations about zoning and also perceptions by developers of, of, of opportunities. Um, but uh, you're saying that contrast reminds me of something. There, there's a very fine economic historian at Stanford named Nathan Rosenberg. And some of you may know him as the co-author of How the West Grew Rich, but actually some of his other books are, that are less famous are more interesting. And he has one on American economic history, and he talks about how very early in the development of, of the U.S. maybe in the early 19th century, Europeans would come here and they would look at U.S. sawmills and they would say, my God, these people are so wasteful. They just, you know, they, they just have all this sawdust and they, and totally not realizing that in the U.S. trees were abundant and labor was scarce. And the, the way the sawmills were operating reflected that. And, and I always see it when I travel in this part of the country after spending so much time on the West Coast. And, you know, I'm always shocked because you'll be driving someplace and there'll be this tiny little house, maybe even a mobile home, and it'll be on this huge amount of land <laughs> that would be worth like, you know, $20 million <laughs> in California. And you're like, they have so much land, why didn't they build a bigger house? Well, <laughs> because, <laughs> and this is especially true not in Clemson or Greenville, but you know, when you really get out in the country, because there, it's the labor for the construction and hauling the materials there that's expensive and the land is cheap. So you have to, you know, the circumstances matter. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you, Virginia, for a, uh, a wonderful talk. Uh, and uh, we will uh, let you all know uh, next semester when uh, the Clemson Institute has its next Pope lecture. Thanks all very much for coming.